Um, before we start off, I'd like to do a little poll. Um, who of you is looking for some kind of a little dictatorship on a small island or something? Hands up. Okay, this is the right lecture for you. Who is um, living in a country or thinks he lives in a country where internet content filtering is applied? Okay, this is the right lecture for you too. And who doesn't care at all? Okay, you, <laughs> you will see why you should care. Okay, I think we'll start now. <clears throat> okay, the next lecture is about censorship and the title is, as you can see, the worst part of censorship is XXX. I thought it has something to do with porn, but no. Nope. Okay, um, uh, the lecture is told by Sebastian Wolfgarten. Um, he's currently working at T-Mobile and is uh, there uh, responsible for network security. Uh, so he's the right guy to hold this lecture. Um, yeah, it's about uh, it's about um, content filtering. I see there are a number of people coming in. Okay, uh, it's about content filtering uh, on a large scale basis uh, um, in the usual suspect countries and especially China. Okay, I'll just hand over to him. Give a warm welcome applause to Sebastian. Okay, thank you very much for coming. I know it's very early already, um, but you're here, so thanks for that. I was up until three o'clock working on this presentation, so I know what it's like uh, being, uh, being up late. Um, basically, my presentation is called, um, or actually the subtitle says it all, basically investigating large-scale internet content filtering. What this means is just another word of saying we're looking at internet censorship. That was something, the reason why I'm doing this talk is uh, because I had, I had to write a master thesis and uh, I needed a topic and so I came up with this topic and uh, my professor said, oh no, no, we can't say censorship uh, because uh, my original idea was to uh, call this thing uh, how to circumvent the Great Firewall of China. Um, but then my professor said, uh, oh no, no, we can't do this because uh, we have so many Chinese students and the Chinese embassy is just down the road and we don't want to have trouble. So I said, okay, let's call this investigating large-scale internet content filtering, and, uh, which is apparently the same, but uh, it has a better title. And it's funny that people think that the X is actually stand for something. Yesterday a guy said, okay, uh, the X must stand for Google, don't they? Or now he said it should uh, stand for uh, porn, but it doesn't stand for anything. I just like the title because it's a it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a of a pun, a play on words. Because basically, the worst part of the censorship is the censorship itself, because information won't be free. But um, ah, just let's start with the talk and uh, stop this boring uh, stuff. Okay, basically, um, basically we have a, a small preface where I'm going to, just going to tell you something about my motivation, how this all started. Then we're going to take a look at the filtering techniques that I uh, that you can employ as an adversary. Here in this talk, in large scale, I mean I don't mean companies or something. I mean countries. So um, we're going to take a look at the different layers that you can use and the different techniques that you can use to do the filtering on a large scale in any country. And um, then we're going to take a very nice 
uh, uh, but brief look at the current situation in the People's Republic of China, where I um, rented a server uh, which, uh, with a bit of hassle, um, but I rented a server a couple of months ago in China and I did all my experiments from there. And uh, last, the last thing is that I'm going to show you how to uh, circumvent the, the filtering in China. Okay, so we start with the actual presentation. Uh, well, who the fuck are you? Basically, I'm just, uh, as uh, Dan Kaminsky said yesterday, just a random stranger. Uh, prior to working with the network security group of uh, T-Mobile, I used to do penetration testing with Ernst Young for four years. And uh, yes, as I said before, I have a master's degree in security and forensic computing from uh, Dublin City University. And uh, the next slide it might be a bit strange, but I thought it's something worth taking into this presentation. Uh, maybe some people in this room are interested in uh, getting certif uh, um, certificated as, or are actually getting, um, or actually getting a, getting a, a degree in IT security. And so I thought maybe I put a little ad in there, and I, I swear I'm not paid by the university to say this, but if you're interested in, uh, in studying IT security and if you have a sp spare year, then I can really recommend this course. It's in Dublin, it's in Ireland, it involves a lot of drinking, but it also involves a lot of uh, hacking. Um, so we did a lot of uh, biometric security, uh, exploit coding, Subverting the Linux kernel, we coded face recognition system, we coded cryptography stuff, so there's a lot of stuff in there, and I think the course is pretty unique, and 90% of all the fees are paid by the European Union, so it's relatively cheap to do, and I can really recommend this, so if you check out uh, DCU's website, uh, then I, I'm sure you find something uh, interesting. Uh, the reason why I'm telling you this is because this has to do with the motivation for my talk. Okay, so basically, uh, the motivation was my Chinese roommate, because I was living on campus at DCU, and my Chinese roommate was basically, he had a degree, he had a, a PhD degree in computer science, he was a Chinese guy, and he was working in the university as a, basically a teacher. So one day we were chatting away and he was saying, yeah, well, you know, the internet in China becomes more and more active and more and more people using it and so on. I was like, oh, well, you know, internet in, in China is not really free, the information are not really free as they want to be, you know, they are censored. And although his English was very good, I have to say, he had no idea what the word censorship or censor, to censor something means. I had a hard time explaining to him that the information he sees are not the information that are available. So he was totally unaware of the word to censor something. So I was like, okay, if somebody that has got a PhD degree in computer science is unaware or maybe wants to be unaware of, of uh, a word uh, called to censor, then maybe uh, other people don't know that the internet is censored. So I, w I, was, I was interested in the idea of, of uh, finding out how the actual filtering works in China, but also uh, how to circumvent it. Uh, obviously, there's always an element of curiosity. I mean, this is always to do with uh, hacking or uh, with technology, I, I think. And uh, when you consider the recent events, uh, many of you have probably heard that uh, the website, the Russian website, all of MP3 was, was blocked in Denmark. Maybe if we have any people from Denmark in the room, um, then they can tell us about this. Uh, basically, we've seen more and more uh, um, let's say, uh, attempts by the government to, uh, to prevent people from accessing certain sites. We have seen this in Germany, and I'm going to show you an example later on where uh, there was a so-called blocking order, or in very formal German, that would be the Sperrungsverfügung, uh, uh, to uh, block certain Nazi-related website. So basically, I thought, okay, this is an area where, where we need some research, and so I d decided to work on this. But now let's really start with this stuff. Okay, so do I have a question? Okay, sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, so, um, so we have to take a look at the, uh, at the filtering techniques. Basically, from a technology point of view, you can do filtering at two, la uh, two levels. You can do filtering at what's called the network layer, and you can do it at the application layer. When you take a look at the network layer, you can usually do filtering at what's called layer three and layer four. You're all aware of the uh, um, OC models and so forth, so I don't really need to explain this too much. But basically what you can do is also is you can do filtering on the application level. And on the application le uh, level you can do stuff like uh, proxies, you can filter at the proxy level, you can do a technique called deep packet inspection which we're going to see later on. And you can do DNS manipulations which, which seems to be the preferred way of, of doing uh, large scale internet filtering at the moment. Okay. So if we take a look at the, uh, the OC model, and I'm, as I said, very aware of, of um, I'm sure you're all very aware of this um, graph. Basically, you can, you can filter 
if you take a look, you can filter at this level the application layer, but you can also filter at layer three and layer four. And in, in Cisco syntax, for instance, these could be uh, rules that you can use to block the, uh, to block access to certain IP addresses at, at central network elements. Okay, so uh, there's nothing special about this graph. This is just an illustration. Okay, so how does this work when you use and when you have a proxy server? Well, it's very simple. In a proxy server, you have a user that requests. When we consider the HTTP protocol, of course, then you have a user that uh, uses a proxy server to connect to a uh, or that or tries to connect to a, a website, and that request is actually forwarded to a central or transparent even proxy server. The proxy server takes that request, forwards it onto the the actual uh, website if the access control list on the proxy server allows, allows uh, uh, the user to access that web, the website. So basically what you can do uh, on the central uh, proxy server you can actually say access, uh, you can actually set up access control lists just like you would do in your corporate environment and uh, the user is unable to uh, access a certain site if the access control list does not allow this. Okay. Then what you can do is what a technique that's called deep packet inspection. Deep packet inspection is actually a technology technology that comes from intrusion detection and intrusion prevention. So basically from network security. But you can also use this technology in uh, in the content or in the context of um, of internet filtering. Because what you do is basically when the user sends some arbitrary data packet, you as the adversary can look into the packet and not only uh, analyze its headers but also analyze its uh, its payloads so the content. So uh, based on that content, you can use uh, entropy analysis, you can do pattern matching and so forth to prevent users from accessing certain targets. Okay? And I have, a very, I have four demos and one of the demos uh, will actually il illustrate this problem. You can do, you can do uh, DNS manipulations. This is a scheme of how uh, uh, DNS works very briefly. It's not quite correct, but just to give you an introduction how it works. And uh, you can basically do th uh, these types of, of filtering. You can actually refuse to resolve a certain name. You can actually deny that the existence of a certain domain. You can hijack uh, a certain domain. So that means that, for instance, Google does not resolve to the real IP address, but to any arbitrary IP address that you define. And maybe if the user tries to access google.com, then you, he will be given a fake IP address and, and if he connects to that IP address, he will be uh, uh, redirected to a different website saying, okay, you're not allowed to access this in this domain. You can do name and validation, which I'm going to show you very shortly, and you can uh, do what, uh, you, can, you can basically be silent when somebody answers or a actually requests a website from you. So as um, I'm sure you're all aware of the way DNS works, I'm going to show you a little example. Here it is. And basically what this should uh, illustrate is basically the blocking order or the Sperrungsverfügung in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, my, in my area where I'm coming from. I'm actually from Northern Westphalia. So basically, um, in two, I think it was in 2001 when all the providers in Northern Westphalia were actually forced to, to block access to certain Nazi-related websites. And they did this um, actually by just doing manip DNS manipulation, okay? So um, one of the websites is actually, actually stormfront.org, which is a Nazi-related website. And so I have a, a little flash demo here, which I'm going to show you now. This is the first of four demos. So now what we can see is I'm trying to do a host lookup, DNS lookup, of the domain stormfront.org. So I'm typing in host uh, www.stormfront.org. And we will see that I get an IP address back because uh, I'm not using a, a Northern Westphalia based uh, provider. Now if I do the same request with a DNS server that is actually located in Northern Westphalia, you will see that the DNS uh, uh, answer is manipulated in such a way as you can see stormfront.org has address 127. Uh, 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 27001. Okay, so this is a very very easy way, but it, to be honest, it's it's still effective as we speak. So in the area of uh, Northern Westphalia, you will not be able to access this website simply because they have changed their DNS servers in such a way that this uh, uh, IP address is actually invalidated. Okay, so obviously um, this is a very easy way to circumvent because you can simply just use other DNS servers. Okay, this is not affected, but uh, I think. This is a very preferred way of do using or of performing, the, of performing uh, content filtering uh, at the moment because I think A, it's relatively easy to implement and B, that's something the even the politicians can understand. So if you tell them, oh, we got this great telephone book of the internet and we just ripped out one page, they will easily understand uh, 
probably better than if you say, are we going to employ IP filtering at some central router element, okay? So they can probably understand that if you erase these elements or these, these, these answers from the DNS system, that's probably um, the best thing to do, or the easiest thing to do, okay? So, um, yeah. I, I don't want to access this website, but if some people want to, then they have to use different DNS servers, I guess. Okay, so if we go on. Okay, so as you can see, um, that's the first, that's the first, that was the first occurrence uh, uh, of DNS or of, of internet filtering in Germany at all. So it was only in North Germany's failure and I think other uh, states in Germany are not affected. But for instance, the scandal with all of mp3.com in, in Denmark, for instance, I think it's implemented in exactly the same way. Okay. So we come to um, the second part of this talk and that's uh, China. What I did for my master thesis, I decided to, um, to go to China and actually check out in the network itself how it works. But I was, well, maybe I'm, I'm, not, I'm rather stupid, but I'm not insane, so I decided not to go to China directly, but, but uh, rent a server, okay? So I, I looked up in Google, how can I rent a server in China? And it was apparently relatively dif difficult, especially because I had to fill out uh, export forms from the German customs and so on. And uh, uh, when I was in, I, I'm from a very small town, so when I did come to the bank, bank and said, uh, look, I need to, to transfer money to China, they were like, what? Okay, and then the next thing was, uh, uh, well, what do you need it for? Yeah, well, I need to pay a, a dedicated internet server. I rented it in China. They were like, what? Okay, so, so uh, they were totally unaware of what I was trying to do. So I said, oh, well, you know, on eBay I bought this MP3 player and now I need to pay it. And they were like, okay, yeah. Uh, that was okay, so. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But I had to fill out this export form and uh, I guess they would have questioned me uh, if, it, if uh, there was more money to be transferred, but it costed, maybe if you're interested, it cost, I think, around 135 US dollars or something to rent the server. So in comparison to Europe, it's relatively expensive, but at least the server was directly connected to, uh, Shanghai Tele uh, to China Telecom in Shanghai, so uh, at least um, I was aware of the fact that, or I was sure that I was actually in China, okay? So this saved me from going over to China because if you have ever seen a, a Chinese public bathroom, then you do not want to see Chinese prisons. You know, so uh, I decided it's better to stay in Europe and uh, to do all this stuff from here. Okay, basically, when we take a look at, at the internet in China, we have to take a look at uh, what's called um, the Open Net Initiatives Internet Filtering Map. You can go to the website of the Open Net Initiative and you can get a flash, website, uh, flash uh, uh, thingy where it basically says all the countries, and um, although this talk is, uh, is centered around China, it, it, it also holds true for countries like Thailand, Egypt, Iran, uh, Vietnam, and all these kind of countries where there's internet filtering employed. And you can see there are different levels of filtering. Here in China, the, the, act, the actual level of filtering is truly pervasive. But, uh, for instance, when you would look up this for Germany, you would at least still get uh, that Germany is on the watch list. Okay, so um, that's still a very interesting uh, map, and it's uh, uh, frequently updated. Maybe you take, you take a look at the numbers before we get into the, into the guts. In China, they have at the moment, and that was from June 2006, uh, around 130 million internet users. So that's actually the second largest number of internet users in the world and it's only outbalanced by the United States of America. But as they have a growth of 20% per year, uh, it is assumed that in a couple of years, uh, they will be the number one uh, internet users in the world, okay? And uh, the best thing is, these 130 million users approximately, they only, they're only about nine or 10% of China's entire population, okay? So we, there's a lot of people that still want to go on the internet, and uh, I'm, I'm interested to see how the filtering continues with this rapid growth of, of, of user base, basically, of, uh, of the number of users, okay? So if we come to uh, what's actually blocked in China, there are actually some laws um, of what to block, basically. What you have to block is basically, you have to block everything that's in some way contrary to the public belief, or at least not the public belief, but the belief that the state has, okay? So everything that might subvert uh, social security um, or uh, social order is forbidden. For instance, you, you cannot say something against the constitution, you cannot say something 
um, that might uh, destroy the unity of the country. You cannot say something that has to do with uh, social stability. You cannot uh, do something against, or cannot say something which involves gambling, violence, murder, and so forth. Okay, as you can see, this is very broad, and I think they did this on purpose because obviously. Uh, well, what does, what does uh, destroying the, uh, the, the unity of the country mean? It could mean anything. When I, was trying, when, I was, when I was preparing my paper in June, July, and August of this year, there was a guy that was arrested because he apparently published, uh, published contrary stuff or subversive, subversive information uh, from a Yahoo account in Hong Kong, which apparently is a different country, but that doesn't matter really because Yahoo gave the information to the Chinese authorities. And this, that, that guy was imprisoned for 10 years for, uh, for uh, subverting the uh, social order. So as you can see, there's a lot of information that, that is actually uh, being censored in China. Okay. So um, if we take a look at the domain name system in China, basically, what I did, I decided, okay, how can you determine how the actual filtering is performed in China? So I said, okay, why not, why not um, use a server in Germany and also a, a server in China and then uh, do DNS resolution on one server and DNS resolution on the other server and compare the results? Okay, so I, I, I um, created a, a sample data set of about 50 domains which I thought that they would be filtered. That included stuff like CNN, the Playboy and so forth and various news, uh, newspapers and television channels and I wanted to know are they blocked in Germany and are they blocked in China. And apparently about 20% of all the domains were blocked in China but none of them were blocked in Germany. Okay, so if we take a look at the actual um, table that I came up with um, you have stuff like Amnesty, which is a human rights uh, organization, or Falun Dafa, which is a spiritual movement. You will see that actually the server fails to, the Chinese DNS servers fail to actually resolve those names. Okay? So you could, if you try to look up Wikipedia, you will actually get an error when doing the DNS resolution. Okay, so uh, this the same holds true for Greenpeace or Playboy or, or, or various other websites. But interestingly, there are some websites where there is, uh, like the government of Taiwan and World Press, where you can get worldwide news articles um, that are basically uh, not answered at all. Okay, so we, you will run into a timeout if you try to resolve these domains. So sometimes they do uh, server failures, and otherwise, uh, for other domains, they don't answer uh, your requests at all. Okay. And uh, again, to illustrate this, I have a little flash demo. Uh, hopefully, we can all see this because uh, I have a different resolution originally on my laptop. Okay, but at least you can see the left part, which is the important bit. Okay, so we have a Chinese server and a German server here, and uh, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to do a host lookup of a certain domain on the left side, on the left hand side in China, on the right hand side in Germany. You will see. That, for instance, here I, I tried to resolve a domain called Falun Canada, which is the Canada uh, appearance of Falun Dafa, a spiritual movement which is forbidden in China. And you will see that actually he tries to resolve, uh, maybe I can stop this for a second, it gets a bit weird. Okay, so just to ensure that you all understand what happens. Basically, is okay, we have a website called, for instance, falunginfo.info. Uh, uh, and uh, you try to resolve the name in China, it first works, but then there's an error injected into your current connection, so which leads to a, what they call a surf fail. Okay, so basically you as a user end up not being able to communicate with this host because the DNS resolution does not work. Okay, and on the German server, there's no problem because all the domains are repeatedly resolved. Okay, is that clear to everyone? Or basically what they do is uh, they basically fake DNS uh, replies. Okay, so they watch out for your DNS requests, and as you do them, uh, they're actually faked. Okay, so if we continue this um, uh, this little demo, I'm doing a request on the left hand side. You will see interestingly that first of all, you get the right IP address, but then you get a serve fail error, so you won't be able to connect to the, to this uh, host. And on the German server, it's no problem to connect to this. The same holds true for the BBC, and uh, on German in the German server, it's no problem to resolve this domain. Uh, on the Chinese server, you will get a server failure um, message. Okay, and there are some domains. I think it comes now. And uh, yeah, well, free Tibet I think works, partially at least. Uh, but then, if you go to certain domains, let's say I think it now comes up with the uh, government of Taiwan. Uh, first, Amnesty. Okay, Amnesty doesn't work either. But uh, if you come up now with the uh, government of Taiwan, yeah, you will see that there is no answer at all. 
Okay, so the packets are silently dropped as, as they go along. Okay, so it says no servers could be reached, and the same goes for peacehall.com, which is a website about uh, the peace movement. And whereas in Germany there's no problem, in China you can't resolve the domain. Okay, so that's a very basic level of how to uh, of how to block people or t of how to prevent people from accessing certain domains. Obviously, you can say, well. I have the IP address for Amnesty now, so I can just try to connect to them, no problem. But the, thing, the, the, the trick is that beside DNS filtering, they also employ IP filtering. Okay? Because, so they basically, in the central router elements, access to those websites will also be blocked. So not only do you have DNS filtering, but you have also IP-based filtering. So although you can maybe resolve the domain by using a DNS server in Germany, uh, you are still unable to uh, connect to these websites. Okay, so here's an interesting uh, picture I took. And the reason why uh, I wanted to create another one with the CCC in it, but I didn't have the time last night. So basically, this is something I created for to play a little trick with my professor, or as, with the assistant professor that was, uh, that was in my uh, final presentation for the masters. I basically took the Chinese version of Firefox. I did go to, uh, to um, Google.cn. I created two queries, an invalid and a valid, and I took Two, I basically took two pictures and merged them into one. So now it appears that if you search in China for Dublin City University, no, uh, no um, results do come up. And uh, as we have a lot of Chinese uh, students, the professor are like, okay, how can we get actually students from over there if we're not found? Okay, which is obviously very insane because I faked this picture. But he wasn't. He he, he never questions the picture, you know, because he thinks well, he thinks uh, that's Google and what they give to me must be real. But apparently it's not, it's faked, okay? And because we all do trust in a certain way, the search engines, I'd say they are a big uh, um, vector for adversaries to filter content. And uh, apparently they do this, do this with two ways. F first you can do what they call, or what, what's called to, or what's referred to as website delisting. So what you do in your result is basically, you just take out certain, uh, certain websites that you do not want to appear. So there was a very good website in America where you could actually use the Chinese version of Google against the American version of Google. And if you, if you search for certain events, then in China you will get flowers and in the American version you will get uh, tanks. So um, that's one way of do, doing filtering. And the other thing is you can do um, keyword censorship. So that means you can just simply deny the fact or deny people the ability to search for certain content. And uh, that's a technique which is heavily employed. Uh, the, all the major search engines in China are filtered. Uh, is it, it could be Amazon, Yahoo, Google, Baidu, and all these other search engines. They're all filtered. And, uh, well, they have, the extent of the filtering varies to, from search engine to search engine. But uh, uh, basically, the bottom line is that you cannot trust them because they're all filtered. Okay. So... What you can do is to web browse, when you're doing web browsing, um, a very weird experience happens. Basically, what happens is, okay, you as a user are here, uh, number one, and you try to access a certain target over here, okay? And um, what you can do, or what happens actually is, as you send your, as, as you send your request from number one to uh, number four to the target system, Basically what happens is your entire connection will be watched out by the Chinese government and if there, is, if there are certain keywords in your connection, then basically the connection will be zapped. It will be dropped immediately in real time. Okay? I have no idea on how many protocols this is actually done. I know it's done for HTTP and if you Google for it, uh, if you read Wikipedia, it's apparently done for instant messaging as well and I think for other protocols true. Uh, too, but I'm not quite sure for all, uh, whether it's done for all protocols or just for uh, the majority of protocols. I'd say it's done for HTTP, probably for some instant messaging and for, for some other ones as well, but we have to figure it out. So what happens is I send my request as the user, the adversary, so the Chinese government basically observes the connection and um, if it's, if it's uh, unencrypted and if there is a certain keyword present in my, in my request, then the connection is dropped immediately. And I uh, have a little demo 
and uh, the way it works is basically uh, they uh, insert uh, forged reset packets into the connection. So because they observe the connection and then they say, oh, there is keyword X, then they send a reset packet to me, but also to the server. So the server thinks I quitted the connection, and I think the server quitted the connection, and then the connection is dropped. Okay? So that's a very neat way of doing things. And I have a little demo. Again, that's demo number three. So what I'm going to do now is I'm on the Chinese server uh, on my shiny little box in Shanghai, and I'm doing a talent on my private server, foyertoyful.wolfgarden.com, and I'm going to do... I'm going to do speak HTTP to the server and I'm going to request a website or a file basically. First, I'm going to request a file once I'm connected called test.html. So we're going to see as I type in get slash test.html and then the normal protocol stuff, HTTP 1.0 for instance, and I hit enter twice and there's the answer. Great. HTTP works fine. So now basically we do the same thing but I do request a file which does not exist on the remote server, but which I expect is filtered. Okay, so we do the same thing again. I connect to the server via Talnet, port 80, and I request get, and then I'm going to request a file called Falun Dafa, which is, or Falun Gong, I think. Falun Gong, yeah. And Falun Gong is a uh, forbidden spiritual movement. And the moment I click, the moment I click, oh, yeah, the moment I click enter twice, you see the connection is closed. Okay? And this is in real time, okay? So as we, really, I, as I press enter twice, the connection was reset. Okay? So this is, as I wonder how they do it because, I mean, for 130, 150 million users, that's a lot of stuff to do. You can do it with pat pattern matching and so on, but still, I think it's a lot of stuff to do, and I was very surprised when I saw this. Uh, and... Um, yeah, I was, I was very surprised and obviously there are countermeasures that you can use and I'm going to show you one which works very nicely against this way of, of, of uh, cutting connections. But in, apparently it works quite well. Okay? So even if, even if they employ DNS filtering and if the DNS filtering does not work, then they have still other means to block you from accessing certain traffic or certain websites, okay? certain information. Okay. Now obviously what we need to do is we need to figure out a way to circumvent the filtering. Yesterday, there was a big talk. There was a big talk from the guy that uh, apparently wrote this Tor software um, that about 35,000 people are using Tor in China already. So I decided to skip the, the section on Tor in this presentation because yesterday the guy uh, told us already a lot about it, uh, and basically it works fine. So what you can do is you can use Tor in China. Okay, Tor works fine, but for 35,000 out of one. Uh, 130 million users, that's not a whole lot. So the, I, I decided to take a look at maybe easier, in some way, methods to defeat the Great Wall of China. Okay, so what can you do? Basically, you have to figure out how the filtering works. That's the most important bit. So basically, you have to attempt to enumerate the magnitude and the strictness of the filtering. So what this means is basically you have to map out the rule set if you're speaking in firewall terms. Okay, so you have to check out what happens if I access this website. Is it DNS filtering? Is it IP filtering? Are my packets dropped? For instance, what's happened, maybe a little side story um, from my experiments. For instance, when I did the DNS uh, experiments with resolving 50 domains in China and 50 domains in, in Germany, uh, I couldn't access my server for three or four days. Okay, and this happened, this happened quite often. So I had often the problem that although the server was alive and running and up and running in, in China, I couldn't reach it from Germany. Okay, so basically I emailed and faxed the provider in China. I was like, hey guys, what's the story? I paid for this, I need access to the server. They're like, hey, it's sitting here, it works. No problem. Yeah. So apparently, and that's what I saw from packet traces, my packets are in between, I just dropped. Okay, so as soon as I enter the Chinese network, basically they dropped. So this happened quite often. It was very annoying because I couldn't do, I couldn't do the, uh, uh, my work uh, when the server was not available, apparently. Okay, so then when you figured out how, how strict the filtering is and how it works, for instance, uh, the reset packets I showed you earlier, then obviously you can make a guess on, on what kind of techniques they employ. Uh, they could use layer 3, 4 filtering. They could use layer 3, 4, and 7 filtering. So this is something you have to enumerate. And once you identify this information, you have to come up with, a, with, with an appropriate way how to circumvent it. So in a nutshell, it's basically the same way as you would uh, use, you, or as you would bypass any firewall. 
uh, but it has some, um, some neat um, properties I want to, to show. So basically, the Clayton method is the first, is the first method I want to show you. The Clayton ma method was, was discovered by a guy called Richard Clayton, and it was discovered um, by, I think, him in, in June 2006. He's a researcher from the University of Cambridge. So how does it work? We have the same setup as before. We have a user that tries to uh, access the internet um, and access the target. Okay, So we have still the adversary uh, that's inspecting the traffic as it goes along. But now the question is, what happens if on both sides of the connection, so you need, you need to have control of both sides of the connection, which is not always... Uh, it's probably not often the case, but if you have uh, uh, um, con full control over the uh, user as well as the this target system, then what you can do in your firewall is just ignore reset packets. Okay, so packets with the reset flag set. Okay, so now basically, although the advisory here is injecting forged reset packets into the connection, so sending basically reset packets to you, but also to the target system, as you ignore them, the connection will just simply continue. Okay, so interestingly, the Chinese government, they only inject, they don't drop the traffic. They just inject forged reset packets to both ends of the connection, and the, but the data flows. Okay, so if you have a way of ignoring these packets, the connection will proceed unhindered. Okay, so that's one way to circumvent uh, the current way the, the filtering works in China. But there's a, there's a little trick here. Uh, obviously, if this is you as the user and you want to access in China and you want to access CNN.com, apparently you have no control over their firewall rule set. So, uh, although theoretically it's a perfect method and it's very interesting and very, it's easy but also very effective, in practice it's not very feasible because, uh, yeah, you can't tell CNN, please, please resort, uh, uh, ignore reset packets, okay? So you can do a lot of things but maybe probably not that, okay? So um, it works but it's not perfect. So you can use alternative DNS servers. And uh, if they are temper-free, if you use, okay, they must not be uh, located in North Rhine Westphalia because they are uh, manipulated as well. But if they are, let's say, in Bavaria or some other country uh, outside Germany, then, uh, <laughs> 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 then, uh, uh, then basically it should work. Okay, so and apparently interestingly is that when I did the testing from China, I um, saw that uh, you can make DNS connections to any DNS server in the world. That was no problem. Okay, uh, but um, as I said before, the DNS requests uh, came back to me untempered. Yeah, there's a question. Okay, I can repeat your question if you want. Well, first of all, this is Should, Okay. So the question was basically whether I tested this only on a dedicated server or whether I tested this also on a, a cable modem in China. As I said, I, uh, to answer a question, no. Because uh, I, I did only rent the server and I was not there in person, so I couldn't test it and I didn't have to have any contacts. So I thought that the best way to do it would be to rent a server. Obviously, if you're an end user, this probably will be different. But uh, as I come later in this presentation, uh, or maybe I can do this now, uh, I would love to do actually some more research. So if you are willing and I would like to join, and maybe there are other people in the room that like to join us, we can re rent a new server, we can use, if you have the DSL modem or cable modem in China, then perfect. Let's start some research so um, we can figure out how it actually works. There's a lot of work to be done, to be honest, and I couldn't do everything, so it's just a start. Um, so if you're interested, we can do some research. Yeah, I, I do, to be honest, I was actually, I was thinking a lot whether, for a long time, whether I should go to China to, to an inter internet cafe and try to do this stuff directly uh, uh, there, but uh, for some reason I chose not to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, a, uh, there's a question in the back. Yeah, 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 that's a big problem as well. Yeah, the question, or the, 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 there was a comment saying, uh, basically, the filtering is different depending on which part in China you're actually in. 
Well, of course, it's a big country, and um, so we would have, in order to do some, let's say, uh, representative research, we would have to, need, we would have, uh, or we would need access to different servers or different places in China. That's something I didn't have. If there are people in the audience that can me, uh, that can support me or like to join me on this, you're very welcome. Of course, yeah, because I I didn't have uh, enough time and uh, I didn't have uh, contacts in China, so I did this the way I thought it would be the best, but obviously there are other ones and uh, we could all work on this together if you like to. So coming back to, because we can answer some questions later on, uh, um, coming back to this presentation, um, as I said, the DNS servers, uh, you're free to use them uh, and you're free to resolve CNN, for instance, without any problems, okay? But then again, as I said, they also employ IP filtering, so I wasn't able, although I was able to resolve the domain correctly, I was unable to access it because they employ IP filtering, okay? So, um, yeah, bad Troy, basically. We have to figure out other, other ways of circumventing the Great Firewall of China, okay? So you can use alternative proxies. Um, yeah, that's something I tried and it didn't work. So, uh, yeah, we can skip this. Basically, um, my idea was, okay, to set up a, 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 central, a central proxy in Germany and then send all requests to that proxy and then just use it to get onto the internet. And the same filtering as a, uh, applies as before. So if I try to access a certain website, then there will be uh, the reset packet sent and my connection is dropped again. Okay, but we can use something called tunneling, okay? And, um, okay, something I couldn't figure out, and maybe somebody in the audience can say to me, I, I assume encryption is illegal in China. So, uh, yeah, I wonder why they gave me SSH uh, access uh, for my dedicated server anyway. Um, because if it's not allowed, then this was illegal already. But, but apparently you can use any protocol you like. I tried DNS tunneling, I tried ICMP tunneling, SSH tunneling, uh, what else did I do? HTTP tunneling, S SMTP, I tried a whole lot and they all worked, okay? So uh, that's cool. But I found out that for some pro uh, protocols, for instance, I tried ICMP tunneling with a, pro with a program called P-Tunnel, Ping Tunnel basically. Um, the problem is that DNS resolution is still done in China, okay? So as the DNS resolution is subject to filtering or manipulation, this is not a, a cool approach because you're still subject to filtering. So you have to figure out other ways to bypass this. Um, well, as you're all very technical aware of what you can do with SSH, uh, yeah, it's a perfect way out. And um, I spoke with guys from Force 10, and uh, Force 10 is a uh, hardware provider that's used, because I gave this talk before at the D6 in Germany, and they have replaced all the hardware with hardware from Force 10. And the Force 10 guys were saying basically, well, look, uh, we delivered hardware to China, and so did Cisco and Juniper, and uh, for instance, we could uh, drop SSH connections as soon as we see your, uh, the, the, the handshaking bit. But apparently, for some reason, at the moment, they're not doing this. So what you could do, you could just encapsulate your data in a transport protocol, uh, send it to what's called a gateway host, that will unwrap your request into the whatever protocol you're actually trying to speak, and will send it to the target system. Okay, so that's not something special, but I will give a short demonstration um, on how to do SSH filtering. This is not special, you all know how this works, but it is a proof of concept that even in China there is a way of accessing uh, amnesty.org. Okay, so what you do is, obviously I log into my private server, that's no problem, I have three different windows here, a German server, which I'm gonna start a proxy, the exported display of the Chinese server, and uh, the SSH tunnel to my Chinese server. Okay, so and what I do now is I'm starting a proxy server on my German server. So there's Squid starting up, no problem. Now what I do now is uh, now I connect to my Chinese server and um, once I'm connected, I'm just doing uh, normal port forwarding to actually, um, to actually establish a session between China and Germany which is secured by SSH. And uh, again, this is not something I need to explain, you all know how this works. Um, so SSH, MySL and so forth. And basically what happens then as when I, when I export the display, so I'm saying basically port 5000 should be uh, locally on the, on the box in China, should be forwarded to uh, port 3128, listening on the local host of my private server in Germany. Okay, so once this connection is established, um, it's uh, cryptographically secure, and yeah, if this now works, 
Okay, so now I'm logged in. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to export the display of the Chinese server. That's what I did. I'm changing the proxy settings uh, on the Chinese. This is basically the exported uh, conqueror of the Chinese server. So it's a bit slow. But if I change uh, the proxy settings to localhost port five, uh, 5000, um, this will be forwarded to my German server, uh, uh, to the squid running on that server. And as you will see now, uh, this is one way of, of accessing mnc.org. And the good thing is that DNS resolution is actually done on the server in Germany. And as this is not really subject to uh, any filtering, I'm able to, to bypass this and uh, this works. So it's a very basic mechanism, but I think it's very powerful and you all know how good SSH for these kind of things is. Okay. Okay, okay so um, that's one way you can do. So as I said before, I uh, would like to more or less close this. Um, Already what I'm looking for is people that are interested in doing some more research. Maybe if you're doing your diploma thesis or if you just like to, uh, like to work on this, um, we would need, as I said, about 110 euro to rent a server or if there are people in the audience that are already in China, perfect. Uh, then we can set up the infrastructure like that or if you have contacts to universities, that's even better. So if, give me a shout if you're interested. I would really love your and appreciate your report, uh, support. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm coming to an end. Um, as you see, as you saw, that's uh, a very, to be honest, a very sophisticated and, and pervasive uh, way um, the filtering currently works in China. And um, my work did, uh, did investigate some of the technology behind it. I also published a paper on my website, devtarget.org, and also various information from my uh, studies. So if you're interested in maybe studying IT security, you can take a look at the stuff over there as well. And, uh, but I think, and that's basically uh, what the tour guy yesterday said as well, we need easier methods to give the ordinary user the ability to bypass the filtering uh, so in order to make it collapse. Okay, so uh, that's it. Thanks a lot. And I'm now ready for answering your questions. Thanks. Good to Hello. Now, uh, what is the state of IP version 6 in uh, China? Does anybody know about that? Because my, it is my understanding that IP version 6 um, mandates um, the implementation of IPsec, and that would basically solve all these problems in one go. Well, what I can say is, what I can say is that um, I know that China tried to, or actually had the idea of developing IPv5 uh, for some reason. Uh, and I don't know, to be honest, what the current status is. Maybe the guy living in China can say something. Can you buy actually, can you get like cable modem access with IPv6 in China? Okay, so the, the answer was they only offer, uh, offer IPv4. Obviously, IPv6 would incorporate uh, IPsec, and then a lot of this stuff would be way easier, but at the moment, there's only IPv4 as far as I know. Okay? And more questions? Um, there were questions in the back somewhere? Okay. Um, if you just give the microphone back to the next guy uh, having a question, or we'll take questions from here with, the, with that microphone. Hi there. I missed the beginning of your talk, but I was just wondering, um, when I walked in, I was a bit surprised because I'd heard almost an identical uh, sort of talk a couple of years ago in Toronto. And I was reminded of the work of Ron Debert, who's a University of, Prof uh, of Toronto professor in political science, who's been doing work with, um, in, with the Citizen Lab. And, uh, you know, he has multiple graduate students um, pulling up websites and worldwide research in terms of looking at internet censorship. Yeah, there's a very nice website from uh, univers uh, Harvard University as well. And the guys from Toronto, they're also um, in the Open Net Initiative. So basically, when I finished my work, I saw that already people were working on this. So I sent them my paper as well. And it's with the Open Net Initiative at the moment. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Okay, because it, it's, it's, it's very similar research that they've been doing okay. for a number of years. I, uh, well, I apologize. I didn't copy anything. So, uh, um, um, I did, I, to be honest, I was unaware that there was already a similar presentation. Okay. Uh, here's a question in the front. There's a As I know, um, most users in China are using the Internet by cell phone. Do you see any way to circumvent the um, Great Firewall? Um, for users who are using the cell phone for accessing the internet? 
That's a very hard question because I didn't try it. But as I'm working as a, I'm working at, as I said, I'm working at T-Mobile, and uh, you could just use any any IP technology you, you want to use. So even over GPRS, you can just use SSH, for instance. So, as I maybe the, maybe if you have a cell phone in China, you can maybe tell us more about this. But I assume if there is no modification being done with the actual GPRS implementation or usage in China, then you can just use uh, normal TCP/IP tools because by the end of the day, this thing speaks IP as well. So. For instance, over the German uh, uh, GPS, I use SSH very often. Those um, CDMA cards are very popular and very cheap, and um, uh, everybody uses them. So nobody uses GPRS, and um, oh, okay. I did not um, see any big difference between uh, access from the DSL at home or using the CDMA card. I would say, I haven't tested it, but I would say it's the same, to be honest. Yeah, but well, it's definitely not the same as if you are a foreigner from a foreign country and then you try to buy something in China. They totally handle you different. Okay, so maybe next year you can do something from inside, the, the inside report from China maybe. Yeah, let's do it together. Okay, yeah, that's cool. Want a shell account? Yeah, okay, <laughs> that's perfect. Okay, so are there any more questions? There's a question in the back, the two questions in the back. Hello, I was very interested to hear about the RST packets that are coming in that yes. are being injected from the network and yes. any of the techniques that we've been seeing are essentially vulnerable to getting reset from the middle. I wonder, did you do any further analysis of the, the reset packets coming in, looking where they were coming from, what timing they had, uh, what their hop count was, this kind of thing, the TTL. Uh, would you care to comment on that, please? Yes. Um, to answer your question in, in a short word, no, because um, Richard Clayton from the University of Cambridge, as I mentioned before, he wrote a full paper on this, and the information you're looking for is mostly in his paper as well. He didn't, he didn't look in the, into the TTL stuff so, so, so much, but there's a lot of information in his paper already which I didn't, uh, didn't want to do again. So if you, want, if you go to Google and f search for... Uh, what's it called? I think defeating the Great Firewall of China or something along those lines. Then you will get his paper, and it's all in there. Okay. Uh, more question? There was one question somewhere. Yes. Um, I don't share uh, the, uh, uh, the certainty uh, that widespread use of uh, IPsec uh, would solve that, uh, because um, uh, what they can, can uh, what they can do is just uh, require. Uh, 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 that the, the IPv6 implementations used in China accept a man-in-the-middle attack uh, 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 from the ISP, or they, uh, or they just don't get any uh, internet. Um, so uh, uh, I, it won't be a silver. Uh, it won't be a silver uh, bullet. Yeah, that's very true. For instance, uh, something which I'm a bit unsure about is also the use of encryption. What about SSL keys, for instance? Um, will they actually will they actually terminate uh, SSL connections as well if they have the keys? Maybe as an operator of some system, you need to give them the keys. I'm not quite sure whether this happens or whether, whether this is done. But for IPv6, uh, for, uh, sorry, for IPsec, uh, the problem is the same, of course. Yeah, there's still a man in the middle, and uh, so I I am not. Yeah, you're probably right. I'm not sure whether this will be the silver bullet, but it will be one more way to try. There's the question here in the back. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, what do you know about IPv9? Uh, according to Heiser Online, that's a new addressing uh, technique uh, for the Chinese network. Uh, oh, was it nine? Okay, I thought it was five. It's okay. a bit like uh, telephone numbers. Okay. And they are developing it. Uh, to be honest, I don't know anything about it. I thought it was called IPv5. Those crazy no, Chinese. I don't uh, know. IPv9, yeah. according to Heiser. Okay. No, I don't know anything about this. I have to deny. Sorry. Are there any more questions? Yeah, yeah just, the, just the, one. Uh, there is a lot of work about how we can understand how fi filter work and so on, but uh, do, you, do you have any idea if there is a, a centralized database uh, about government capacity? I mean, uh, who are working with those governments? Which are the companies who are selling the material? Who are the consultants who are hired by the, the government, like in China? Because, I, I mean, there is more than 30,000 persons working in China, but... Yes. I mean, there is Cisco, there is an uh, occidental company uh, selling technology. There is any centralized information about who is selling what and uh, which can help you maybe to work? I, I tried to figure out this information because obviously I wanted to know what I'm up against. 
but uh, I was unable to find any information. Well, I tried. I really contacted some companies, and they said, "Look, we don't comment on our uh, business, and that's it." So I know it from Force 10 because I talked to Force 10 people. And if you read the papers and if you read other uh, uh, other uh, articles, it, it always says, "Well, it uses Juniper and Cisco." But you will not. You probably not get a list of all the companies involved. Yeah. I tried to do this really hard because I wanted to know, but. It's the same with the filtering techniques. They don't give you information how it works. You can try to experiment with it, but you cannot figure out how it really works. Yeah. I think there was one more question uh, over there. And there's another question here. Okay. Hello? Okay. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, what information is there about the infrastructure of China? Is the distributed filtering uh, with the providers helping, or is the central gateway of the government? Yeah. Um, what I found out is that uh, it's uh, at least on the experiments I did, it, it's done on the central on the central infrastructure of China Telecom, which is something like Deutsche Telekom here or France Telecom, for instance. So it's done at the back end, uh, uh, sorry, backbone providers. Yeah, and also on also on the on the incoming uh, uh, points of the Chinese network. So as soon as you enter China, basically, and go out, obviously. There's one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you've done your test, have you been disconnected from the network? Uh, completely disconnected from all the rest because uh, I heard about the Freenet project that uh, the Chinese government uh, harvests all the nodes that are running the network and try to block them. Um, what do you know about the social engineering that um, Chinese government is, uh, is doing? Because the Freenet is now um, using Darknet. Um, is it a good way or is it the government uh, filtering? Uh, I mean, harvesting all the network to find uh, people who is uh, trying to uh, to hack the network or, and stopping them directly. Yes, as I said uh, before, um, I had the problem that my server was often unavailable, and there was, it may be coincident, but it, it was always the case when I did some action. So let's say I did the 50 domain uh, uh, resolves uh, uh, in a row on the Chinese server. Let's say half an hour later, the server was blocked. So uh, these kind of things. But I'm not quite sure. Maybe the provider did give my uh, did, give, did, give, uh, did give my address or my purpose to uh, the society uh, to these uh, authorities. I don't know. Uh, I think for some reason when I reg re registered the server, I mixed up my old ad uh, German address with my new one. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm, maybe I can't go into China anymore. I don't know. I don't know how it works. Okay, so maybe there was one more question, and then we should all go. <clears throat> yeah, I would Hi. like to know, you talked about this real-time keyword filtering, yes. is it done by the content too? Uh, uh, yes, it's, it's, I saw it for HTTP, you can actually, the filtering is done only on the name of the, of the, of the file you're requesting, but also on the content. So, so when your test.html is the content like free Tibet, it would be blocked too? Yeah, yes, yes. <coughs> That's what I saw at least. Yeah. Comment, question, yeah. anyone? Maybe I, I misunderstood something, but uh, you told it probably won't be easy to uh, say to CNN.com uh, to not drop reset pack, uh, not... Uh, um, to drop reset packets, yes. Yes, um, but you also said your proxy would also drop reset packets, packages, but I think it would be easy to tell your proxy not to, not to acknowledge reset pack packages. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And wouldn't the, no, that be a what solution? No, what I said, what I said uh, uh, when I used the proxy my, uh, um, with an unencrypted connection between Germany and China, yeah. then, the, then the Chinese, uh, because they were observing the connections, were then sending reset packets to both connect ends of the connection. And as you said correctly, yes, that's the way. If you make your proxy, um, if you make your proxy, proxy ignore reset packets, then that's one way to go. The problem is still that the adversary, i.e. the Chinese government, can still see all your connection because it's unencrypted. But you're right, it works. Yes? Okay. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Okay, one more question, comment. I think you have nothing to fear to come to China. Um, <laughs> actually, I don't think that the government will care about um, some foreigner just um, trying to check out their, their oh, methods. Yeah. And um, you can also imagine what kind of um, avalanche you will, um, you will release if they just um, um, set some foreigner into prison. I mean, they are much more perceptive about their own people, but if you come there as a foreigner, it's totally different. And yeah. then Chinese law even um, deals different with um, if, uh, if somebody hits a foreigner, then somebody hits the Chinese person. 
Well, I'm so, working. As, the thing is, I'm working at Deutsche Telekom so I, or T-Mobile. I have a lot of holidays, so I, maybe I spend my next holidays in China. Okay. Yeah, actually. <laughs> actually, um, I do have a guest room. Oh, perfect. You're invited. Thanks. So, thanks everyone for uh, for watching and uh, questioning me and so on. If you have questions, uh, always going to be around. So uh, you can always ask me, and we can drink a beer or something. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>